there are places that exist as ghosts. An abandoned shopping mall, its once bustling food courts now silent. Or an empty amusement park where the laughter of children is now only echoed by creaking steel in a lonely wind. These are places in transition, neither fully here nor there, where the divide between the mundane and the mystical is thinning. What lurks in the shadows of these spaces? Are they merely unsettled landscapes disappearing in time? Or can they serve as literal gateways to the beyond? From childhood imposters encountered in uncanny lands, to doppelganger stalkers on a routine bus ride. Join us as we uncover unsettling accounts in liminal spaces and explore the boundary lands that exist at the edge of worlds both known and yet to be discovered. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. Jury. Close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Magicians are demons, Specters, and Spirit spooks, Summonings, Paralysis, Strange Disappearances, Sky Whale Phenomenon, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hi. Hello, hello. I'm Jeremy. I'm John. And I'm Chris. And we are the Brothers of the Belief Hole. Welcome to the strange space in between. Yes. Tell us what we're doing today, Chris. All right. This is going to be an interesting episode. I've been talking recently about getting back into spiritual architecture a little bit, which we did. And this kind of folds into that. So it just seemed like the right time to do it. What is it? We're going to be talking about liminal space. And if you don't know what liminal space is, don't feel bad because it's a, it seems complex at first, but it's really not. It's a mood. It's a transitional time in life. And we'll break all that down. But we're not just going to be talking about liminal space as an idea or a psychological impression based on a landscape. We're going to be talking about liminal space and how it relates to the paranormal, the unusual, the unexplained, and how liminal space might be a sort of magnet or even boundary for these things, these entities, these strange experiences that people have had. So for example, you think about liminal space online, I don't know if you're on YouTube ever and you, or you're watching an ambience or something, um, or you're watching a film and they have you know, a scene of an empty shopping mall, an abandoned swimming pool, a vacant amusement park. These are things that kind of leave you with this haunting impression. But what is it about these spaces that have this otherworldly impression? They're places of transition. They're things that they serve a purpose, but are not serving their purpose right now. Like a, a school during the day, for example, filled with kids is just a school, a normal school, you know, energy, laughs. But at nighttime, if you go into that school and it's empty, there's sort of an unsettling, uncanny feeling about that. The build, it's like you're in something that's asleep. Yeah. Almost like you're not supposed to be there. Right. It's often open, large spaces that almost convey a sense of loneliness or even an unsettling kind of anxiety or fear because it is something that is made for, think of a space station or like a horror film, a sci-fi horror film, like the event horizon comes back and no one's on it. That's a liminal space. You know, there's supposed to be life here, but there isn't. It leaves you with that kind of feeling. Generally like where lots of people are. Yeah, exactly. Or it's used a lot by many people. Right. Like a high school or something at night. Yeah. Another good example on a smaller scale is even like a, like a waiting room, right? It's a place in between things. So that's another example of liminal is it's a transition. So a waiting room is a liminal space. A gas station is a place that isn't meant for people to occupy for long periods. So I guess I'm a little confused about the transition part. I mean, is that like a mall space, like a hallway in the mall? That's a good point. If you, cause if you think about it, a mall specifically... A mall is kind of a giant hallway. Like you're kind of spending most of your time in the in-between deciding 
if you're going to go into a store, what store are you going to go to? Most of it is a place of kind of, yeah, that limbo, like, okay, am I going to go here? Am I going to go here? Most of your time is spent, I feel like, at least when I go to the mall, it's that in-between space of the food court or the big walk area between all the stores. That's kind of the what makes up most of the mall. It's kind of a giant hallway. It definitely makes up a big part of it, yeah. And when you're in a mall, there is that sort of feeling of airport, you know, movement, terminal. You're, everybody's going somewhere and coming from somewhere. Energy constantly moving around and mixing. Yeah. And that's, that's also the idea of liminal. Liminal is also described in like psychological, sociological terms of like in your life, a liminal time is like right before you have a baby or, you know, right before you start a new job. So it has to be a transition space. I didn't know that. I thought like even it could be like a big office building. I know. I think so. There's two types. It's, I think it's kind of important. At least I, it, to me, it seems like there's two types. There's the, the transitional space, like a, a bus stop or a subway. But then there is also the more, I guess you could call them places of permanence in a sense, like or, or place you spend a lot of time, like an office space. But in those situations, that's when the transition becomes the emptiness, the emptiness when it's not in use when it's not being used as it should, and you're in this space that feels haunting and broken or open. Um, the energy that's usually there is not, but there's like echoes of it there. Exactly, because technically a subway car with people in it can be a liminal space because it's transporting you. It's that bridge with people on it. You're not meant to be there too long. It doesn't feel as liminal aesthetically as an empty bridge, but that's still technically a, a liminal space. But you're right, John, if it's a, you know, um, an office if there's no one in it, that's what makes it liminal. It is its own liminal space of time before and after there were people there. Right. And I was trying to break this down in my head of, of what this is and kind of how it connects with the stuff we talk about and how you can feel unsettled. And is there a reality to the unsettledness, a reason to be unsettled? I, mean, I just wrote this quick thing to summarize my ideas about it. There's something about these transient spaces they are familiar and ubiquitous. A room is just a room. But, for instance, a hotel room is not your room. You're not meant to stay there. These places aren't permanent, but a place for you to exist only in the in-between. But that in-between has a special energy, electrified by the potential of what could be, and focuses you on the now, and at times, the nature of reality itself. And if you stay too long where you don't belong, you may find yourself in a different reality altogether. So that's a little expo <laughs> a twilight zone at the end. <laughs> but the basic idea is like, you know that feeling when you're in a place where, you know, you always, I always get this high when I travel, even walking in a hotel room hallway at night uh, or just in the elevator. You get, there's just this bonus energy you get from the travel experience someplace new, but the place itself has an energy. Yeah. And yeah, like we are talking about, John, those times when those places are no longer used, you know, an abandoned hotel, or a hotel when no one's staying, it's you're the only one in the building. This haunting kind of feeling of the lack of energy that it was supposed to house just leaves this empty space for, out of the surreal, I feel like. Yeah. But in these kinds of places, what might you encounter, I guess is the question. How does this tap into our real world? And do they overlap these kind of Twilight Zone experiences with the liminal? Exactly. Yeah. These liminal spaces, transitional locations, if you think about it, taking it right into the paranormal. You know, we know it's a psychological thing, that feeling of there should be people here, there aren't. But what about the possibility of real supernatural activity in these places? What is it about these places that may draw things there or keep things there or keep things at bay with these sorts of boundaries? If you think about it, a ghost itself is its own liminal space because it's neither living nor dead. It's itself a transition. It's in this transitional state. In a lot of these places where you hear some of the strangest stories or where you hear commonalities between a lot of stories, they seem to share locations. For example, um, thresholds, shadow people is a great example. We'll get back to that later. Um, elevators, bridges, crossroads. These are all famously haunted places and they're all liminal transitional spaces. A few quick famous examples. You've got the 37th parallel. 37th parallel, it's a UFO highway the frequency of, of UFO sightings and unexplained phenomena there is crazy. It spans across the entire United States along a specific latitude, which is that 37th parallel. It has a bunch of documented mysterious events, animal mutilations, all kinds of stuff. Um, of course, ley lines are great examples of boundaries where significant sites are like ancient monuments, things like that. But more specifically to the construction things that I think are the, the ones that really captivate your attention when you arrive at one, like a bridge in the mist, you know, um, a tunnel. 
So you've got bridges. What comes to mind? For me, it's obviously Billy Goat's Gruff. Yeah, you got the Alton Bridge, that the Goat Man that we've covered before in Texas, Denton, Texas. But of course, the biggest example, I think, is the Mothman. The occurrences there, the Silver Bridge Collapse. And not only was that a physical liminal space, that bridge, that tragic night. In Point Pleasant. In Point Pleasant. It's also connecting Ohio to West Virginia. So you have that barrier there, and there's a water barrier, and it's leading up to Christmas. The energy of that, that transitional time, end of the year, you know, that's a very liminal time. So you're saying that this event was unique and maybe so powerful in its, I guess, strangeness with the Mothman because of all the liminal characteristics of it being over water, being on a bridge, these kind of spiritual architecture, yeah. liminal transitional spaces, and then leading up to Christmas as a time of like all this energy coming forward and then just the complete tragedy and destruction of the bridge collapse. Yeah. I mean, at least those are interesting things to take note of when you're considering all that stuff. Oh, the last thing I was going to say about the, the Mothman, I didn't want to spend too much time on it because this is, an, is not an episode about John Keel and the Mothman. But what's interesting is when John Keel was investigating leading up to the bridge collapse, because people were predicting there being a big blackout, he was getting all these contacts from abductees telling him about these predictions. He started getting strange phone calls, right? This is all trickstery behavior. But a mimic, there was a mimic of himself that was seen around town, some sort of doppelganger of John Keel. And I wanted to mention that because I'd kind of forgotten about that, but that ties into one of our stories coming up later of a mimic in another liminal space sent in by one of our own listeners. So I just wanted to bring that up. And there's a common thread with the trickster being involved in liminal spaces and liminal time periods. And I mean, the Mothman, you could definitely classify in that scenario. No one knows you know, people speculate, was he bringing an omen of caution? Did he cause it? All these things. Yeah, I think the trickster thing is fascinating because these are the characters we meet on the side of the road. And a lot of these paranormal encounters, if you will, are they all one thing? Are they this trickster embodying these different forms, like the, you know, the alien in the bedroom, the hitchhiker on the road? But the trickster finds a home in the liminal. You know, it's always the, the trickster visits when you're on the way to somewhere. You have the sinister hitchhiker the otherworldly innkeeper. It's the perfect atmosphere to play your trick and get away with it, if you think about it. No one has home field advantage, and the trickster will use that against you. There's just something in these stories, and you guys have heard a lot of these, but I feel like there's an extra creepy, tingly vibe with things like, for example, mysterious disappearances on cruises, uh, theme park horror stories, Urban myths about getting shanghai you know, visitors from out of town getting abducted. Oh, yeah. Terrifying. There's just something about being already off kilter in a new place and then the strangeness or the, the energy that can provide opportunity for just an extra bizarre story or the trickster to play its, its role, I think is fascinating. But yeah, Chris, what do you have coming up? What example can you give us of one of these, maybe where the, the liminal meets a paranormal but real reality? The fence in the field is a great example of liminal space. One of my favorite places. Yeah, it's a borderland. You don't get much more liminal than that. And I've had the story that was sent into us a while back, but I've been saving it for a dimensional portal episode, but it just works so well with this, especially because it lines up with possible trickster element. And it, of course, has these liminal borders and liminal aesthetics of the field, the empty field at the edge of the wood line, the fence line anyway. Uh, I thought this is a fantastic story. Incredible account. Was this submitted to us? Yeah, this is a submission to us. He wanted to keep his name anonymous for the audience, but we know it. Well, to get back to the fence and field story we're about to play, uh, it's important I wanted to note just an example of the liminal experience. A great example is when you're coming out of a place, like leaving a tunnel into the relief of like an open space. But another kind of reverse of that might be, well, you could say leaving a, a forest and then entering the openness of a field, mm -hmm. but then crossing that field to a fence when you get to that fence, you're, yeah, you're in no man's land and you're at that spot where all there is is this thing that just divides two places, but it still just feels like this kind of undescribable, intangible atmosphere where you haven't crossed over yet. You haven't made that choice, but it just feels like there's something there. I don't know. It's just really hard to talk about liminal spaces. You, you get to experience it, but go to the, go to one of these places we're describing. And then just, if you haven't felt that sensation, be open to it. I'm sure everyone's been to a fence in a field, but maybe. Anyway, let's, let's hear this one. So this is called The Fence in the Field, and this took place in Abington, Massachusetts in 1991. When I was eight, I had an experience I can't explain. In an attempt to keep the story short, 
Something or someone, posing as my best friend, I believe, saved my life. Our neighborhood was a dead-end street, encircled by acres of conservation land. There was a distant field we'd sneak into through a hole in the fence in our neighbor's backyard. We'd done this multiple times with no issue. However, on this occasion, stepping through the fence felt like entering another world, eerily mirroring a dream I had the previous night of the two men in the same field. These men weren't quite human, and one had what looked like an arrow quiver on his back but contained objects I couldn't identify. Anyway, as soon as we popped out, my best friend says, No good, we can't stay here. Despite not seeing anything unusual, nor the two men from my dream, I was somehow absolutely paralyzed by fear the moment I saw the empty field, now unmistakably familiar. I was utterly confused when my friend had said we couldn't stay there, but I didn't care at that point. I was so glad we were leaving, I tried to climb over the fence, but attempting that seemed impossible due to the dense brush. Then my friend butted his head back out of the hole in the fence and yelled, What are you doing? Let's go! Now with a serious sense of panic in his voice, I crawled through the hole and both of my ears immediately popped and popped hard. Pop like I've never felt before or since. Stranger still, my friend at seven years old turns to me in the voice, tone, and authority of an adult says, Make sure your ears pop. I said, They just did. He looks at me and says, You're sure they popped? Yes. I said adamantly, and he just shook his head knowingly. Okay, good. He said with a serious sense of relief in his voice, gesturing for us to climb out of the landscaping at the back of our neighbor's yard. As we left, he claimed his mother had called him, though I heard nothing. He insisted on going to a music class at school, which was odd given it was July, and he didn't play any instruments. Watching him walk away, he didn't head home, but towards the far side of a detached garage. Curious, I followed swiftly, only to find him vanished without a trace upon reaching the garage corner. No hiding spots, no sound of movement, nothing. Two days later, I confronted him about his sudden disappearance and the lies about his mother's call. He laughed off my questions, claiming he had been at his cousin's all week. Despite my frustration, his family confirmed his alibi. This left me bewildered and without explanation. I will, however, close with this. One lasting impact of this event was my fear of the field. I never went back through the hole in the fence, but compelled by a need to understand, I asked my father to accompany me there. The field was as it had always been, normal and unchanged from the countless times before, except for that one unexplainable day. This experience has led me to ponder the fate of those who disappear without a trace, possibly transported elsewhere. All I can say is, if your ears ever feel like they're full of pressure and all the sounds become muted, like there is cotton in your ears. Go back the way you came, immediately. There's a lot more detail I can provide, as well as walk you through where it happened on Google Maps. Maybe I'll hear from you. Be well. Strange. Interesting. Yeah. That's definitely something I've never heard of before. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because it's like, what was this this imposter that was not his friend? Obviously didn't seem like it was there to hurt him. Because it didn't do anything to him. It kind of like was there and then was also kind of taking care of him. Maybe something taking over his friend. Yeah, but his friend wasn't in town. Oh, so it wasn't his friend at all. Right. That's what's so strange about it. And what did it have to do with the dream he'd had the night before about those entities that were in the field with the weird quiver? (laughs) I don't know. It's just interesting to me because it just reminds me of like we're talking about the trickster aspect with these liminal spaces. This all happens in this field with the fence and transitioning through the fence. It's, you know, transitioning into another world almost. So this is a place they've gone many times before. Yeah. And they go through the hole. So I guess they're just getting together to hang out and play. 
Yeah. Essentially. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he's been, maybe he's been, maybe this thing has been his not friend several times before and got him used to this area. And for some reason they were supposed, he was supposed to lead him here, but it was the wrong time or dangerous. And so he, he recognized that and said, we have to go. I mean, who knows? There's so many question marks in this one. It's also, this is, if it even happened, this happened to him at seven. So who knows? Yeah. How much do you remember at seven? I mean, that's a lot of detail too. Yeah, but it's a, I think it was an interesting story to bring because of the, the situation. Um, and there's so many questions to it. It just reminds me of like when we were kids and how much time we spend in these kinds of places. Like we had a meeting spot or with Jared back in the day where you'd go, out into a, you'd go to a place where you could meet and hang out that obviously wasn't a permanent place because we didn't have our own permanent places. We were kids. Yeah. Especially like as a teenager, if you think about it, we always refer to teenagers being in the time of transition, probably more than anything as like a human experience because of hormones, physical development, the teenage, like you're, you're transitioning into an adult and it's a time of complete unsettling. You know, there's a lot of drama that happens coming out of being a teenager into adulthood, but you look at where teens hang out and it's always malls like mall rats, you know, the mall being a very liminal kind of space. Parking lots. Parking lots. Yeah. People still hang out. The kids will get together in parking lots and hang out in their cars, which is cool. I'm, I'm glad they're still hanging out at all. With, uh, you know, the, the smartphone issue, as I sound like an old, old person, everyone on their phones. But yeah, the idea, it's almost like being in that time of your life, a kid, but especially as a teen, you are drawn to places that kind of reflect where you are, which are places in between, places you can hang out, even though you don't have your own space, you live in the in-between. And that it adds to that energy, I feel like. I don't know. That's just kind of a random thought that popped up. Yeah. But what do you think out there? <laughs> Leave a comment. Please comment. <laughs> We're lonely. <laughs> anyway, what's another place to go? What's another liminal space we can explore the strange encounters that might happen there? Speaking of malls, yeah, this is, this is a weird story. You know, I always think of the mall as a liminal space, especially now. I mean, even the current mall. I feel like I'm in a liminal space there, even when there's people there. It's just a weird place. It is. Well, it is. Yeah. Every, you know, the energy is so strange, but I think it's even stranger. I think in more kind of endearing or compelling, I guess, in a way when it's a very vacant mall and some of those malls that are like half abandoned that you can go into because there's like one planet fitness in there and everything else is gone. Yeah. Such a strange feeling and strange place. But yeah, so like in every aspect of the living mall, the dead mall, there is this liminal value to it. And a lot of times I'll put on like, you know, ambience videos while I'm researching, I'll put on liminal space, mall core, vapor wave. Oh yeah. Mall core music. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of these like kind of vintage, very reverberating, down-pitched music playing, kind of indistinguishable with like some mall ambience. Well, I think that started during COVID for me. Everything was closed and I just wanted to feel like I was out in a space. And there was something kind of nostalgic, but also, I don't know, mysterious about the space of a mall that I just kind of missed. So there was something that the idea of the liminal and kind of the backrooms idea, I feel like collided at the same time of like vaporwave and mall soft and mm -hmm. mall ambiences uh, in infinity pools you know 80s like there's <laughs> i'll put link shows to some of my favorite just weird ambience videos of just like an image of a, a hotel pool in the 90s and no one's in it yeah there's like an old coke machine in the corner with a little glow and there's just like some vaporwave music playing in the background it just gives you this very specific and i think for us nostalgic vibe from that time period but yeah the mall is a strange place i feel like strange things can and do happen there and here's an example this story is called the men's department smiler yeah, where'd you get this from this wasn't submitted to us right no i got this in a collection of stories from albert rosales oh nice play it up barbara considered herself an average 65 year old woman she had seen a lot of things in life in fact, Barbara had been forced to adapt to many changes, one of the hardest being when she found herself wheelchair-bound. But Barbara was not the sort to give up, and so she wouldn't allow those challenges to change the way she lived her life. In June of 2008, she and her husband decided to go shopping at the Century Third Mall near West Mifflin. Barbara's husband wasn't big on shopping, so we opted to sit on a bench and wait while she went into a department store. Barbara made her way to the men's department and was a bit amused to see a mother hustle past her. The woman was hurrying and huddling her children together. The little boy was dragging his feet. I wanna see. He cried as his mother dragged him along. 
No, we need to leave now. His mother admonished him. Barbara wondered what the dispute had been about. She made the turn around some clothing racks and stopped dead. Standing before her was a male figure wearing blue pants and a plaid shirt. The being was not human though. It was bald and wrinkled. The figure had bumps all over his gray skin and his eyes were very dark and almond shaped. Barbara did a double take and in that brief second, the figure moved much closer to her. He faced her now and gave her a gentle smile. Barbara struggled not to stare, thinking that maybe this was a man with some terrible condition. She quickly shifted her eyes away, then right back again. In that brief span, the figure disappeared. Barbara hurried to a cashier. She was agitated and asked if a security guard could be called. She explained that she was looking for a man who had been in the men's department. The security guard allowed her to view the tape with him, but there was no one to be seen in the area after she entered it. Barbara's husband rejoined her and insisted that they had to go. By now Barbara was rattled and frightened. Exactly what had she seen? Barbara and her husband had been planning to view a movie at the theater in the mall, and so they continued on with their plans. When she tried to explain what had happened to her, he insisted that they had to hurry not to miss the movie. He would listen to her story later. Barbara spent the rest of her time in the mall scanning faces for the little, gray, wrinkled skinned being, but she never saw him again. By the time the couple got home that night, Barbara decided not to mention what she had seen earlier in the day. It was just too unnerving. The entire incident eventually seemed to slip from her mind. Her experience remained unthought of until one day in early October when Barbara opened the Pittsburgh Tribune Review newspaper and froze. Her eyes had been scanning down the columns when she saw an article about a UFO sighting. Suddenly, Barbara's hands began to shake. Deep in her mind, something was stirring. She couldn't have explained how she knew but she was certain that the being had repressed her memories of seeing him. Barbara told her family about what she had seen, and then she contacted the Western Pennsylvania branch of the Mutual UFO Network. Regional MUFON director John Venter interviewed her. He looked into the case and found that on the same evening that Barbara had her strange encounter, someone else had reported seeing a UFO in the area of the mall. It sounds like an incredible tale, but Venter would later write about the case. Normally I would write this report off as a hoax, but she never changed her story and was completely convinced that she saw an extraterrestrial being. Weird. Was it? Was it an extraterrestrial? Aliens at the Mall just reminds me of that recent news story. Maybe we can talk about the expansion. It's weird it smiled at her. (laughs) Hello. Yeah, you don't usually hear the smile. In these kinds of reports, abduction. I wonder if it's like a watcher. Yeah, there's definitely something more sinister. Not that ETs are all friendly and fun, if they are ETs at all, but that's, yeah, the smiling. Where's the sinister part come from, you think? I don't know. You mean, why is it sinister? I mean, what what was sinister about that? You know, I think just for me, I think you're right. I think it's reader response. It probably depends on the sort of smile. I think the smiling and approaching and then quickly being like right in her face and smiling, I, that to me just seemed like, and I could be totally wrong. Could just be a very friendly, you know, entity that's getting up close. I guess that threw me off. Yeah, I was thinking it was like a, a friendly smile. Oh, that's kind of sweet. I think I'm just jaded. It probably was just <laughs> someone looking for a friend. Yeah, I guess not like she ran off. So I guess maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't a scary, creepy smile. Do aliens smile? That's the thing. That's why I don't think. Well, first of all, just because there was a UFO report doesn't mean that this was an extraterrestrial. No, it's it's exactly why it happened. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's weird, though. It does remind me of that. John, did you hear about that whole mall thing in Florida? Uh Uh-uh. The Miami Mall is on the news. Alleged alien giants caught on tape. Oh, I did vaguely hear something about that. Mom, of all people, informed me about that. She's got her finger on the pulse. She's on the Facebook. I think she might have heard on Coast to Coast. It'd be interesting to talk about sometime because there was more to it than I thought initially was pretty explainable. Yeah, initially I saw a video 
And it was a very strange video of this giant kind of blurry thing from kind of an aerial view with all the police cars and then this massive thing walking, casting a shadow along the wall. And then someone allegedly debunked it and said, well, here's the original footage. It's a group of cops, just blurry. It's a group of cops walking together and it was blurry. So it looked like this giant creature. Uh, and they, allegedly they all, all these police had responded to looting or... Oh, it was a big fight. It's supposed to be like 50 kids or something. Like a teenage brawl. But all these police had responded. So I don't know. We, we didn't get a chance to look deep into that. Maybe in the expansion we'll talk about it. Yeah. There were alleged eyewitnesses that you can find giving their side of the story that were there and saw these allegedly otherworldly entities. But yeah, it'd be interesting to talk about. But the, the weird thing is that they were shadow, right? Wasn't that one of the arguments is that they were like giant shadow beings of some kind? Yeah. That's at least one thing I heard. Um, and that's just interesting because synchronistically the shadow connects to this, which I think we'll get into after the break. But the idea of the shadow is like the definition of the liminal. And then, of course, the mall. Happened at the mall. The mall is my favorite of linear spaces. Liminal? Liminal. That's the word. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's take a quick break. When we get back, we're going to get into... Stranger stories. Yes. And stranger places. What's going on for the expansion? So the expansion, I wanted to expand on this idea, but take it to, I think, some of the most bizarre cases, and a lot of them focusing on the beach. perfect liminal space oh yeah the beach i mean you just walk up especially the ocean yeah it doesn't get more liminal than that you feel that kind of endlessness the view of the infinite with where the the water meets the shore this kind of permanent transitional space just feels so i don't know i always get weirded out at the beach i love the beach but it is a for me it's a strange place i feel like you're at the beach well we're not at the beach we're in an airbnb down from the beach well you were at the beach yesterday i was yeah you're much closer to the beach than you normally are. That's very true. Yeah. We were in Florida. We were at the beach yesterday, and it is a liminal space to be sure. I just stood there for maybe 10 minutes just staring off at the horizon, watching pelicans pull fish out of the water. And I was like, eh. <laughs> it's like, I got to get back and prepare this episode. <laughs> this is awesome, though. We were there long enough to feel how just strange that place is. And I'm sure we have listeners who live, uh, you know, on the coast. Um, and are probably just used draws, to it, but... I think it just draws you in anytime, anybody, whether you're a landlocked guy like us or you're... Oh, yeah. That expanse, you're just pulled towards it. And the closer I started walking to it and hearing the, the waves, I just started to get that sense of like, come, come. Come toward me. <laughs> Enter me. Okay. Enter me. <laughs> a little forward. Well, you know, as a, as a body of water. Uh, it is weird that that pull towards... There's a reason the waterfront property is so expensive. You could say, well, it's just a, it's a big open space that's more peaceful. But obviously, it's the water. You know, you don't have field front property that's valuable. It's something about that boundary between solid and liquid water and, you know... I know. It's definitely powerful. Yeah, Absolutely. We probably won't have time for it again, but I, I keep wanting to retouch on the spiritual architecture, but it always reminds me of those water barrier discussions we had with different cultures around the world talking about creating boundaries for graveyards by burying the dead on um, an island in a river. Right. Water blocking certain energies from being able to pass. Right. Who knows? Maybe we'll get to the touch on that. Maybe in the expansion, we get into the bizarre beach encounters and uh, strange phenomena on that boundary line of land and sea. Oh, I did. I was thinking of an alliteration and Beach Boogeyman came into my head. And it made me think of John. We were we were at a rest stop on the way down, driving down, and some kids were running around everywhere. And there's this older gentleman that was sitting there watching these kids run and realized that these kids were putting themselves in danger, running out down by the road as people were pulling up to stop. And so the way to get the children to stop, he yelled, don't go up there, kids. There's a booger man. There's a booger man up there. <laughs> There's a booger man. Yeah, which, because that's, you know, whether, depending on where you, what culture you're from. Well, that's where booger comes from, right? Yeah. In England, it's a bogart. A bogey. Down south, it's a booger. In your nose, it's a booger. Yeah. So it was cool to actually hear someone say it that way and not just like a boogeyman, but a, a booger man. It's just funny that you heard that. I know. It was weird. He was wearing all black, too. I was like, is he a witch? <laughs> Don't go that way, kids. It's a booger man. <laughs> that's great. I would probably remember that for the rest of my life if I was that kid. Interesting. That's probably the most interesting thing that's happened to you all year. <laughs> I said it. <laughs> Pretty much. I need people to know I've had interesting things happen to me. So. <laughs> That'd be a good date story. Yeah, it would be a good date. <laughs> Tell you about the booger man. Speaking of boogers. Like, what happened to you this year? Well, <laughs> you guy yelled for the booger man to stop when there was kids running. That's my life. What did you much. do for years? <laughs> do you like potatoes? Want some potatoes? 
Yeah, all right. Well, okay. let's, let's take a break. <laughs> let's take a break. <laughs> Chrissy's potatoes. <laughs> and we'll come back and we're going to have a good time with you guys. All right, guys. We'll see you in a minute. Now, here is a clip from this expansion episode. Access granted. The witness was walking back from the beach area towards the camping site when at a distance of 150 meters ahead of him, he caught sight of two men in dark clothing that ran across the trail and vanished into some bushes. Moments later, he saw them again on the path ahead of him. They were somewhat short, slimly built, and dressed in dark green outfits. Their faces were green, and they had large almond-shaped eyes. Halfway down their abdomen, they were covered by a short mist. Hanging from their belts were black boxes and violet and yellow colored cables and spiral wires. At the same time, he caught sight of a hovering silvery oblong disc, misty in appearance. He then received a telepathic message telling him, quote, don't be afraid. He continued walking slowly and the two beings stepped off the path. The witness experienced a strange sensation and received additional telepathic messages, but he continued on and left. Later, strange marks were found on the ground where the object had hovered. The witness also noted a short period of missing time. Welcome back from the break, guys. Hi. Hey, everybody. Hope you didn't get lost in the, that liminal space that we left you in. You know what I find to be another liminal space sometimes? What's that? The kitchen. That's true. Sometimes I feel a little discombobulated, a little, a little loosey-goosey, especially if I've got something I'm working on. Loosey-goosey. But something that can solve that problem is factor. This episode is sponsored by Factor. If you're not aware, they're a delicious, ready-to-eat meal company. Mm. It's uh, super quick, two-minute meals. You just pop them in your microwave, and you are all set, ready to ride that yum. But it's so much better than fast food. Oh, yeah. Got the nutrients, whole foods, but it comes right at your door and ready to go. The great thing about Factor is you've got 35 different options to choose from every single week. And you can pick different plans. Like you can do Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, Keto, whatever you're into. Yeah. Whatever tickles your hungry bone. Yeah, they're delicious and obviously super quick. If you're a very busy person, it's a great way to not have to think about food. And, and we've done the math. And Factor is actually less expensive than takeout. Wow. When you get on the factor plan, we've done a lot of takeout, uh, working late in the <laughs> hole, and it drains your pocketbook as well as your health. So check out Factor, guys. Absolutely. Head to factormeals.com slash beliefhole50 and use code beliefhole50 to get 50% off. Yes. That's code beliefhole50 at factormeals.com slash beliefhole50. There you go. To get 50% off. Do it. That's a great deal. Link will be in the show notes, guys along with all the information you need to get that factor. Rock and roll. All right, well. Now back to the show. Where's our next liminal space? Enter the void. <laughs> Welcome back into the liminal space of the nothing and the everything. It is all things. Now, I thought about that too when we were doing, talking about doing this episode. Trying to define the liminal, when, especially when, it, when you're talking about like a time in life or something. Everything is kind of liminal. I guess it, it's relative. Life is temporary. Yeah. Every period of your life is temporary. It's all this kind of, temporary time where things can change it's really just relative like if you're in college for four years you know you're young and you're there this feels pretty permanent it doesn't really feel like a liminal experience but then as time moves on and you're 40 years old and you look back you're like that was a very liminal time yeah everything is yeah relative <laughs> wow how profound <laughs> <laughs> it's all relative i don't know it's just i'm just trying to think about the the term i mind you say something so many times and it starts to lose its meaning i got a word for you do it trying to find it it has it's a weird word i've never heard before i wrote it down it's like qualia or something qualia have you ever heard of it is that the word qualia uh i mean it's very close i'm looking it up right now but it's an interesting definition qualia yeah qualia it's uh defined as instances of subjective conscious experience oh it's a hard word to define because it's like uh Examples of quality include the perceived sensation of pain of a headache. Yeah. The taste of wine. It's, you know, they're, you can't really describe it unless you try it. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of, it's like the redness of an evening sky, qualitative characteristics of sensation, 
It's just an interesting... Yeah. Interesting. That's, I mean, it's really does super work with this episode. Yeah. Because we talked about... Liminal kind of has to be... It's about your emotion to the experience or the atmosphere. Especially in a space, like a liminal space. Like, you don't really know it until... It's like synchronicity. Right. Like, you don't know a synchronicity until you feel that synchronicity, and you can't explain why that is. Exactly. Good word, John. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, D- didn't just look it up on a app. <laughs> you know, like word game. It came into your life. I don't know where I heard that today. It was today though. I was like a YouTube video or something. I was just like, oh, that's interesting. I've never heard of that before. Qualia. 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 Let it be within you. Yeah. And for people watching on the YouTube and people not watching on YouTube, I'm sure I'll have uh, a series of images pop up that are described as liminal and that's kind of the effect is they give you that feeling or a lot of people that feeling of being in this kind of uneasy place based on the atmosphere whether it's a building who's lost its purpose or a place you shouldn't be a lot of it is large chambered areas a weird surreal sense of space where anything can happen and much does <laughs> as you will hear <laughs> i swear i swear a lot happens there. i want to make a like a liminal space stinger as you can be sure we're gonna be doing a dark mountain ambience for liminal liminal space like some kind of weird 70s stinger i feel like <laughs> yeah i don't know like the wnir theme song yeah 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 something like that <laughs> wnir well no not like that because it'd be more like mysterious 70s vibe i'm excited for the the sound design i just feel like this would be one where you could have boards of kennedy e synthy Stephen Lynch. Yeah. Stephen Lynch. Or can I always get David that? Lynch? David Lynch. <laughs> Stephen Lynch. I always confuse him. <laughs> David Lynch is like, yeah, if you're talking about film and liminal space and that feeling, David Lynch is definitely like the, he's the yeah. guy for that. That uneasy, film, yeah. strange, puts you in a place of not being comfortable and not knowing why and feeling out of control of time and space. That's yeah. kind of what these places are in a very slow, intentional. I've never been a super fan of his work. I like him as a person, but. I've just, I don't, it's okay. I love Twin Peaks. Yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's it's very kind of... It's definitely an acquired sort of taste thing. Yeah. Has he done like a really popular film? Blue Velvet was, I mean, they're all kind of underground because they're his movies. They're all off I Lost Highway. That was like during high school because they had like the Nine Inch Nails on there and... Mulholland Drive. That was oh, Mulholland one. Drive. Yeah. But they all leave you with an unsettled feeling, which is kind of his thing. And that uncanny valley he really captures, I feel like, in his in his movies. Not like in the way you get like with robots, <laughs> but like a different sort of, like something is off kind of feeling. Everything's almost right. Twin Peaks is very interesting because it, it almost is comforting because it has a sort of soap opera sort of feel to it in soundtrack, but just a little dissonant. It like hugs you, but also whispers in your ear, something's wrong. Yeah, the idea of something being off. The liminal space is is the uncanny valley of atmosphere. It's familiar, even a transitional space like a hotel room or whatever. You recognize the space and it's familiar to you. And yet, you know, you don't belong there for whatever reason, whether it's an office building that's closed. One of the reasons why I was drawn to becoming a janitor when I was young, one of my favorite jobs, uh-huh. was spending time in places where they exist in a way you don't normally see them. And it just gives you this energy. But it is that uncanny kind of feeling. Yeah. Surreal, um, otherworldly. Yeah, and it is like looking behind the scenes of reality, which I think just in those places you get this feeling of, I think it's more, I don't know, it triggers a way of thinking about reality in general. What is behind all of this? Yeah. That's kind of what I come away with it. Well, let's, let's visit one of those other realities yeah, let's right now. let's get some glances of the, the zones beyond. Yeah, what story do we have next here to, to display the uh, liminal? Oh, <laughs> this is a pretty great one. This one, I guess you titled this. Did you title this one, Chris? No. Where did you find this? This is yours. The Time Travelers? Oh, no, this one. Oh, I thought you were doing the other one. No, this one's great. Time Travelers at Wendy's. Uh, I think that's actually what it was titled. This is, this is really interesting, and I'm recommending this website. It's kind of like what we're doing with our Strange Listener Stories archive, but it's a website called liminal.earth, and it's map first. So basically, you, you land on this website, and then you have the map of the globe. I'm not sure if it's just North America. It might be the globe. But then there are pinpoints, and you can click on a, on a region and see a story of a strange encounter in that area. So I went to check it out, and we were in Florida, so I clicked on one in this area, and this one was funny because it was submitted by someone named Jeremy P., which is, of course, your name, Jeremy. 
That's me. I just thought it was a perfect little example of a liminal, even though I don't think all the stories on this website, even though it's called liminal earth, liminal dot earth are actual liminal locations or liminal time periods or whatever. But this one happened to be very liminal. But Wendy's is a liminal space. Well, yeah. Fast food places are very liminal because they're transitional zones. They're not meant for long-term occupancy. You can eat there, but you can't stay. It's not your actual dining room. They're places between destinations like airports and bus stations. Anyway, this one was great. And it also involves maybe a time slip. That's very related. So here we go. When I was seven or eight, my family and I were eating at a Wendy's restaurant in Central Florida. While we were sitting at the table, a couple entered the restaurant dressed in 19th century Southern attire. She was wearing a hoop skirt and bonnet, and he was in a riding suit of some kind with a little top hat. Now this is a theme park area, so we first wondered if they were actors of some kind, but then we noticed that they were dirty and sweaty, and their clothes were patched and worn as though they'd been traveling for a long time. They looked kind of stunned and bypassed the dining room encounter, walking directly to the water fountain. For at least a solid minute, they stood at the water fountain, inspecting it thoroughly, but never taking a drink. Then, without a word, they left. We looked out the window, but couldn't see where they'd gone. So reenactors from Disneyland? No, they had patched clothing. And were dirty. They looked, they, like, they didn't understand the water fountain. Case closed. <laughs> yeah, who knows? But yeah, in the, in the land of the bazaar, those are the kind of stories you hear about, whether it's time travelers or kind of conscious spirits, you could say, where they don't understand modern technology. Even men in black, you get those stories a lot. Mm -hmm. It's like Twilight Zone. Yeah, very Twilight Zone-y. So who knows? It, yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, I just liked it because it, it, anytime I get a potential time slip story, I'm going to share it. And it works with this episode with the liminal space of the, of the fast food restaurant, people traveling. And the theme park. Theme parks are very liminal. We talked about that on our Dark Amusements. Remember, we had that conversation about the energy of that place, of how, you know, people are having intense emotion, then it vacates. Yeah. And then it's just in this empty space, but still full of this lingering energy. Yeah. Very heightened, whether it's fear, terror, love, or... A lot of fights, a lot of alcohol, <laughs> at, uh, especially Universal Studios. It's the best and the worst, but all great times of high energy. And yeah, what, what kind of residue remains? Yeah, I'll have that website linked because uh, it's pretty interesting. Cool. Shall we move on to another? Yeah. Oh, this next one's great. It's liminal in multiple dimensions. It, it takes place on a beach and it involves a time period in your life where you are really have just finished crossing through the liminal space capital l birth this is called cursed beach of the monkey man this takes place in mastic beach new york 1990 to 1993 and this was reported by ryan this experience left a major impression on me and i can see it as if it were yesterday it occurred when i was between one years and three years old I would stand in my crib late at night, and in the window, I would see this hairy-like looking creature that looked halfway between a monkey and a human. It would visit me almost every night. I still get intense, vivid visuals just telling the story. I told my mother as a small child and said, he was the monkey man. When Halloween came around, my mother said someone came dressed in an ape-like costume, and I freaked out, thinking the monkey man was at my door. It resembled the Twilight Zone episode of the Gremlin on the airplane wing. I think this was actually a Sasquatch encounter, and they exist in a realm next to ours. The land is also very strange. It has an eerie feel to it, and the natives said it is cursed land. And to this day, no matter what the county does, it never seems to be able to become a vibrant beach neighborhood. It's uncommon on Long Island to have an issue like that with waterfront property that close to the Hamptons. Weird. Be careful where you buy your beach house. Mm. Very strange. And I have to add this in, but I missed the line where he described a hypnotic trance that it would put him in, suck him in as a little baby. Yeah, that, I mean, you hear that all the time with alleged Sasquatch encounters. 
They seem to disappear out of nowhere. And they're very curious. They're always looking in windows. I've heard that connection with children often. Unless you listen to our last episode, <laughs> that those Sasquatches were not curious. <laughs> oh, they were no. <laughs> horrifying. Yeah, they were curious what your insides looked like. <laughs> I think they were a genetic experiment. Oh, you like that theory, huh? Well, I mean, the, the door. Yeah. You know, I mean, I put the sound effect of the door in there, so that could be kind of misleading. Well, that's kind of how he described it. It was a... Uh, well, yeah, he did say that it was like a scraping, like a, a big door closing. I just don't know. Yeah. I mean, that does sound kind of interesting. And the fact that there was a bunch of different ones there. Different types of entities. Different types of entities. It does kind of seem like a, an experiment or something. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle style, like you were waiting for Bebop and Rocksteady <laughs> to come down the hill. Mm -hmm. No, you're right, John. The, the description of that, that was Martin Groves, I believe. Or they came from hell. There's another option. Yeah, that door, I mean, to me, the door definitely sounds like, I thought of that too, and I also thought of just a, a dimensional gateway. You remember we did like the um, the sky quakes and the trumpets in the sky? Yeah. You always wonder, is that some sort of dimensional opening happening? And you hear that like screeching semi-truck times 10,000 breaks of a semi. Just have a listen to this. What are you hearing? Well, we don't really know. The strange sounds were heard across Terrace, B.C. early yesterday morning and lasted for about 10 minutes. But similar sounds have been recorded in other parts of B.C. and reported in other locations around the world. People keep promising the Nephilim are going to right. open the doors underground and come up when you hear those sounds. That's the idea is that there are these giant, basically angel security gates that are opening. They just keep getting lost. And they're coming back, yeah, for the end times. I think that's kind of the general idea. Correct me if I'm wrong, listeners, but I'm always, that's such a creepy idea, these giant, massive Nephilim sleeping underground or basically being chained up under there. And uh, these skyquakes, the explanation is that they are being released, but I feel like they'd be here by now. So I don't think that that's necessarily the answer. <laughs> yeah. Not saying they're not down there, but. Yeah, that's not my theory but who knows yeah just a w weird explanation of a place again you have the legend of the cursed land this mastic beach any guys out there from or near mastic beach i wonder if it's still like that it's interesting yeah it reminds me of um that sort of vibe from even though i didn't like the season american horror story when they're in that sort of new england coastal town and everybody's kind of gone for the season i think that was long island oh was it i'm not sure but it felt like that yeah romantic setting for sure uh, but uh, definitely kind of isolating that feeling but yeah, the cursed ground, the creature in the window, very liminal. Last thing I'll say before we jump to the next story, but maybe some of these entities that you hear about that are jumping around, leaving places quickly and not being seen, maybe they use liminal spaces to travel, like jumping liminal space to liminal space. Oh, that's interesting. Ooh, weird. Yeah. That just kind of occurred to me. That's weird, man, because that reminds me of, um, we talk about the idea of entities or spirits or things on the other side using shadows as a vehicle in this reality. Oh, yeah. And to me, that joke about that one encounter the guy had, not joking about his encounter, but just joking about the fact that this weird little leprechaun creature was caught trying to cut the shadow from this man. Yeah. As he stood there, you know, on that rock side or whatever. We talked about maybe shadows are being used as some sort of vehicle. Right, yeah. A literal metaphysical cloak that you could use to come into this world. And isn't there a connection? I mean, I guess if you think about shadows as being a liminal, they're like the liminal thing in the sense that they are the only two-dimensional thing in reality. Yeah. You were talking to me about that idea. Yeah, what's interesting, I was just, I came across, during the research, one interesting blog I came across was from Homespun Haints, uh, which they have a podcast, we'll link that, but this really interesting write-up on the liminality of shadow people. And uh, I thought this was interesting. They said, quote, Shadows are the only truly two-dimensional objects that exist within our three-dimensional world. Sure, we say that a photo is two-dimensional, but that paper with ink has substance. It really only approximates two dimensions, because it's too thin to easily perceive its depth. What about a film projector on a screen? No physical substance. It's just another type of shadow. As neither an expert on physics or metaphysics, I'd like to speculate that shadow people lurk in doorways, because as two-dimensional creatures, they feel more at home haunting two-dimensional liminal spaces. And think of how they would feel about us. To these flatlanders, three-dimensional creatures moving through the doorway are probably difficult for two-dimensional shadow people to perceive. We would therefore be unperceptible, startling, and seem to appear and disappear without moving. 
I just thought that was kind of an interesting thought. But the threshold thing, that liminal zone, you know, you hear about shadow people, like my experience, shadow, the shadow person that I had was in the doorway. It's such a common thing. So it does make you wonder. It's interesting. It reminds me of that classic description of what uh, other dimensional entities or the things that we see in the sky, for instance, UFOs or, or you know, alleged craft, we see them move in these extremely strange ways and blip in and out. And one of the ideas being if they are multidimensional or other dimensional passing through our realm, then we would, and I've tried to explain this before on the show and I didn't do a great job. Well, it's like a bobber on the surface of the water. If you're a fish. Yeah. You see like part of an object, but you don't really know what it is or how it is operating the way it is because you can't see the full picture. Right. Or like a pencil passing through a piece of paper. Yeah. If you are in view of the paper, you will only see the piece of the pencil that's passing through and not the entire thing. Right. But yeah, that was kind of what she was making that kind of parallel with the shadow people. Yeah. Maybe they're jumping from liminal spaces. This is why I keep my closet doors closed. I am in the closet right now. <laughs> that's true, you are. I I'm recording the closet. It feels very liminal. Yeah, we are, we're in a liminal Airbnb right now. And Jeremy is in a liminal closet, literally five feet from me. And I forgot you were in there. Who keeps their closet door open? Jeremy doesn't want doors on his closets at all. I like, I like having all my doors open. That is, that is dangerous, dude. <laughs> he likes his door to the hallway open and his closet door open. I'd rather have my door open. You are inviting demonic... No, right? so you are, you are creating a home for a shadow. No, entity. no, no, no. You are allowing, you're, <laughs> yes, you're yes, like, yes, that's where they live. You are basically saying, come in at any point. There is no barriers. <laughs> Wait till I'm asleep. You're allowed to just do whatever you want to me when I sleep, <laughs> when I'm sleeping, you can just like Lord over me. I'm and... telling you, I can't give them those dark spaces to hide in. That's what I'm saying. I'd rather look over and see an open space. You can't see them anyways. They're invisible, but now they're just in your room. They're only invisible because you have the door closed. John, I'm with you. Doors closed, please. No, you close those things. That is just absurd. Okay, then next time you hear the door creak in the middle of the night, it start to open. I don't because my door's shut. You're in a situation I'll never be in. <laughs> I've solved that problem. My door's shut and locked, bro. I lock it. You what? I lock my door. <laughs> you lock your closet doors? No, not my closet. <laughs> What's my, I'm talking about? My bedroom door. Obviously, I don't leave my front door open. My bedroom door. Oh, bedroom door. Well... Yeah, I, I'll leave. It depends on the flow of the house. You leave your closet door open? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That is insane. <laughs> you are you, a weird boy. You gotta face it head on. No. You can't give him a place to hide. I can't imagine you just... Okay. <laughs> so your reasoning is that you don't want to like let have anywhere to hide in there? I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm not... I don't have a super big preference either way. No, you do it for... You do. No, I don't actually leave them open every night. Most nights they're closed, but it doesn't bother me if they're open. Oh, okay. I thought it was like a, I thought it was a thing. No, no, no. I'm not doing it. So <laughs> he has told me before he wants to keep, you don't do it for supernatural reasons. I'm not a fan of doors. Well, let me be, let me be clear. Let me be clear. I'm not a fan of doors on closets, period. Let me be clear. I am not a fan of doors on closets, uh, on cabinets. I just don't like them. I think it's a, it's an opportunity just for clutter and of course, evil demons. But mostly clutter. Like, if I close the door, I know <laughs> things will be messy in there. Yeah, but there are, they'll be messy anyway. Now you just see the it's mess. It's an opportunity for clutter and demons. <laughs> I'm telling you. Clutter demons. It's just, it's, that's just how I approach life. Okay. Anyway. So let me ask you this, though, before we move on. So, like, if you're creeped out by an episode that you just did and you've been researching into the dark night hours. Yes. Is that when you will open the closet door? Oh, no. I'll ch Welcome in, boys. I'll certainly <laughs> check for an intruder occasionally. But uh, I don't really close or open for that purpose. Okay, okay. I just, I feel generally it makes more sense to have them open. If you're worried about their hiding creatures. I'd rather just not know. I don't care if they're in there. I just don't want to know about it. See, that's the thing. I'm kind of the same way, especially when it comes to the spiritual stuff, because I feel like if you just don't pay attention to them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you show fear, that's when they come. Like it does. That's it. Be afraid. You all taste so much better. You're afraid. There it is. Someone's going to leave a comment about that on YouTube. I think you left some people dissatisfied last episode. You didn't bring up Pennywise. Someone said in the last comments, let's face it, guys, this is the It podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh, that's what that comment meant. You got to keep the joke going, man. Don't want to disappoint. Uh, they called it the It hole. The It hole. That's what it was. And I didn't pick up on that because I'm dumb. Yeah, you keep your closets open. I don't keep them open. I'm just saying I'm not... You're the type of person that would keep your closet open because it's too much effort. Well, keeping them re requires Why effort. Why would you close it when you just have to open it to again? To keep something, anything requires effort. I just I just choose not to be concerned at any given time. All right. I think we've had enough time with this topic. I'm sorry, audience. Let's move along. 
more closet physics in the expansion. All right. This next story is about closets. Not really. <laughs> That'd have been a great segue. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Here's one, John. I think you might like this one. I found this oddly funny. I mean, probably shouldn't have. You tell me what you think. That's a great story. I call this Jogger Witnesses Beach Abduction. This took place in Talaboa, Puerto Rico, November 1979 at 9 a.m. Nice short little strange account. A man jogging along some flats near the beach was approaching an area covered with brush and coastal vegetation when suddenly he noticed several strange figures standing next to some small trees. There were about five to six beings, six foot tall and very thin with large, bald heads. Their most outstanding feature was their large, slanted, luminous eyes and their gray-blue skin color. They also had long, thin arms with long, fine fingers, and another peculiar feature was a row of sharp, pointed teeth in their mouths. The beings appeared to be struggling with a dark-haired man that appeared to be in a stupor. They were attempting to carry him to the nearby seashore, where a shiny metallic domed oval-shaped craft hovered low above the ground. The object had multicolored lights and was completely silent. Suddenly, one of the beings noticed the witness and pointed at him. At that moment, the witness felt mental communication from the beings that appeared to laugh and make fun of the witness, imitating him by jogging back and forth at a very high speed. <laughs> the witness then heard the being say that he was going to be taken also. But another one of the beings intervened and said it was not necessary. At that moment, the being that had made fun of the witness suddenly threw something at him, resembling a large, clear drop of water that felt cold as it hit him square on the chest. The witness then felt numb, but kept running and left the area. The witness was so terrified that he waited 11 years to tell anyone about the incident. It is unknown what happened to the dark-haired man the aliens were attempting to kidnap. And that comes from Jorge Martin, Evidencia Avni, number one. But yeah, I just thought that was funny, that visual of the aliens pointing at the guy once they realized he was there and making fun of his jogging by <laughs> resuming quickly back and forth. <laughs> like, what's he doing? It's just such a weird, <laughs> weird thing to do for those guys. My favorite thing about that story, other than the really, really unique description of the blue skin with the sharp teeth. Oh, the six foot beings, yeah. Which reminds me of something. At, oh, Galaxy Quest, those little creatures with the teeth. Oh, yeah. But... Other than that, the unique description is that they have a sense of humor. Yeah. You rarely hear that when it comes to these encounters. So I just love that. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, that one did smile in the mall. That's true. Yeah, what's happening out there? There is some sort of emotion going on there. That's a good point. Was that one in the mall? Was that a blue gray skin? That was like a blue... Gray wrinkles, wasn't it? It was a, a wrinkly gray skin. Wrinkly gray skin. Yeah. We do have some weird connections and... In the expansion, we're going to be getting into some of this because this was a beachside coastal oh, yeah, this is great. area where this guy was jogging. And in the expansion, I came across a lot of liminal, I guess you could say spaces because they are the beach. A lot of strange beach encounters, and some of them tie oddly together. Uh, accounts of a particular kind of being that I found because I was searching for the keyword beach. I was looking for beach stories because it's a liminal area. And I found one in red. I was like, that's kind of a weird, interesting story with this strange giant creature with a particular body structure. And then I found another story also took place on a beach, but instead of Australia, like the previous story I found, this one took place in Spain, but described the exact same entity with the exact same associates, you could say other beings around it. And it took place one month later of the same year, 1989. That's so crazy. So it seemed like there may have been some kind of, what's that fun word that people like to use? referring to like phenomena flap flap there you go i don't know why i couldn't think of that that's a fun word some kind of flap which i don't know if it's been identified but i found these kind of corroborative accounts taking place months apart of the same year with these weird pear-shaped head giant creatures on beaches somehow working with the ocean water or something anyways that's going to be fascinating yeah some true research work from you jerry good work on that i'm excited i hope that in this episode people enjoy it because it obviously part of it is an excuse to tell stories in liminal spaces. So it's, you know, yeah. the vehicle for the episode was trying to get into that vibe of the liminal space and what that is. And then in that offsettled atmosphere, the kinds of things that can happen. But yeah, it's, it is a very strange kind of concept to approach for an episode as far as just describing, just getting into the liminal itself. Yeah. I feel like I've said liminal way too many times. <laughs> I know. Anyways, 
Anyway, speaking of liminal spaces and transitive mediums like video and audio, let's get into our final story, Chris. Yeah, this one is going to be touching on that transitive aspect of travel, the transitive of movement from going one place to another. And it's also going to touch on, I think, a fascinating aspect of the of this whole conversation that I wasn't expecting but keeps coming up is the, the mimic or the doppelganger. As I mentioned before, John Keel, that famous Mothman, Silver Bridge Collapse, and the mimic that was posing as him around town. This is a great kind of mirroring of that, and it makes sense that we're mirroring it by ending the episode with this story from one of our very own listeners. This comes from Natalie. I call it Doppelganger in Transit. And this happened in Norfolk, UK, 2013 to 2016. Hi, guys. First off, I love the podcast. Secondly, I have so many weird stories and experiences to share, but this one really shook me up. So back in 2013, when I was a student, I went through a phase of insomnia that coupled with early morning seminars made me feel pretty strange at times. One morning, I was on my usual bus route to university. The bus stopped at a regular stop. Sometimes I'd board there. In my peripheral vision, I saw a young woman board the bus. I remembered thinking, huh, very, very similar glasses, hair, and clothing to mine. Well, this person moved to sit in the seat directly behind me, at which point I glanced up at the reflective surface of the bus wall and they were looking right back at me in this reflection. I couldn't gauge the facial expression. It was sort of nonchalant, blankness. I glanced away with my heart pounding. They slowly took their seat. I told myself the incident was due to stress and lack of sleep. However, following this, over a three-year period, there were multiple incidences in which people I knew told me they'd seen me around in places at times that didn't match with my actual whereabouts. One coworker said she'd seen me a few days prior driving past her. I didn't drive at the time, nor was I taking lessons. She was adamant it was me. Sometimes I wonder if there was some sort of dimensional intersection and another version of myself was out there doing her thing. Creepy. Reminds me of that experience I had in Canada. Oh, what was that again? Is it a dance club? Yeah, it was like a big club dance place, and I saw that person from like really far away. Oh, yeah. Probably like 60 yards or something. And it just like the mannerisms and everything were just so similar to me. That's so weird. And I just remember, like, I my I, I just remember my heart started just pounding because I just felt like I had died or something. It was the weirdest feeling. Weird. And uh, ended up, you know, getting close enough to him that it obviously wasn't me, but oh, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> or um, did he take your place? Are you him? <laughs> Who are you, John? <laughs> nice try, mimic. I mean, he looked like me, but it was obviously we weren't twins or anything. It was it was definitely like we looked very similar, and just the way he moved. Yeah. And his mannerisms, you know, from a distance, it looked very, very similar. Did you guys become best friends? I didn't even talk to the man. You should have talked to him. Be like, hey, this is weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been weird, Jeremy. <laughs> I don't really remember my state of mind other than being like kind of freaked out in the moment. Isn't that weird that that was your reaction? I feel like that's a lot of people's reaction that like the girl in the, the story we just heard. What was her name? Natalie. Natalie. That experience somehow triggers this deep innate fear yeah i mean it just didn't feel like it's a the feeling of something that shouldn't be real when you're awake yeah you know that feeling of like this should be a dream or something but you're you know you're awake yeah that's so bizarre it's almost like yeah built in us like if you run into your doppelganger run don't make friends <laughs> or anything else like it would be you know anything else that shouldn't exist that you see <laughs> you know that shouldn't happen in in this version of reality right is going to cause some sort of a panic. I think it's a protective mechanism to protect us from our doppelgangers. I think that's what it is, personally. Well, you keep the closet door open, so you would think that. <laughs> I don't keep anything, anything, John. It is what it is, and I let it be. I don't let it bother me. <laughs> You're such a clown. We, By the way, we got, we've had some really great mimic stories and doppelganger stories come in. Uh, one from Cass, which kind of would have worked from this episode because it was also at a beach house, which was a really great creepy story, but we'll save it. A lot of great stories coming up, but uh, yeah, liminal spaces, man. Yeah. Those are the places. Liminal spaces, those are the places. So I got a question for you. 
because I was interested in this topic and it's because I've seen some stuff on YouTube, Mm -hmm. not reality based, but I don't, did you guys, did you look at all on YouTube for videos? Yeah. What do you mean? It's about like back rooms. Yeah. That's what I, I was knew, thinking. Of. I knew that was going to come <laughs> off and I was like, dude, we should talk a little bit about back rooms. And Chris was like, no, well, we don't need to talk about that. It's not like, it's like a creepy pasta. And I was like, yeah, I but I didn't it's... say we didn't need to talk about yes, it. Yes, you did. You poo pooed it. I think it falls into the, I, it isn't real obviously, but I think it's a perfect, just cultural yes. kind of phenomenon. And it is really strange and creepy. And exactly. I well, think it's plenty worth talking about, even though it's not exactly reality. I thought so too. I mean, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't saying we shouldn't. Yes, you did. Oh my God, you're the worst. <laughs> I was like, John's going to bring up backrooms. You never said that. I didn't know he was interested in that. Well, I figured if he's looking online, that's what he's going to come. That's what's, <laughs> I said, what is culturally? You never said that. What's in the culture right now is, especially on YouTube, which we you know we're talking on social media, online platforms, that's what comes up when you, well, yeah, in the middle space, because it, whether or not, yeah, obviously backrooms are more of a, they're an idea, like a, an exercise in the unsettling, unknown. Liminal space horror. Liminal space horror. That was what I was going to partly title this episode. Because not only like there's a lot of examples of liminal space where a lot of strange phenomena can happen. Of course, we talk about allegedly real encounters, you know, strange things you might encounter at the beach or, or in a mall. That's stuff that we'll talk about because there are things that happen in liminal space. And it gives it this extra unsettling and I think interesting nature when it happens in these kind of liminal spaces. But it's, yeah, as far as backrooms go, uh, that's an example. I, I wish we had video right now. I just want to give a quick rundown of what Backrooms actually is. Yeah. It's basically, it's liminal space horror, but the way they do it, it's like a whole bunch of different ones out there. Some of it looks like found footage. I think that's kind of the general vein of it. Yeah. Or yeah, or at least a POV style shot. Like the infinity pools. POV, kind of grainy. And the whole thing is, you know, there's people, expl- It's it gets weird. Yeah. It's almost like these explorers from another universe or something are like, you know, hazmat suits on. Right. They get dropped off in this place, like office buildings, you know, gigantic, weird, never ending pool rooms. Yeah. You know, they move throughout these buildings like they're hunting something almost. And then inevitably at the end, there's just this horrific, bizarre creature that's kind of like hunting them down. And it just ends in a very weird and just <laughs> unsettling nature. Yeah, I never I never watched it to the end, but throughout it there were like these little there were these little cues. It's been a while since I looked at the back rooms, like watched the back room videos. You never actually watched any to the end? No. Oh the ends the whole I, thing. I figured it was leading up to something, but I didn't want to spoil it. So I didn't watch it. So I didn't finish it. <laughs> but throughout those yeah, throughout the videos there's these little cues of oh okay, there's something wrong here or something ahead. It's not right. Like there's something written on the wall that's, okay, that's creepy. Or you see a flash of something. And yeah, so I figured it was building up to, towards something. What makes those back rooms so that the horror of that is, you know, it's not an encounter with something in a liminal space. It's the space itself. I mean, that, I mean, that comes at the end, as you're saying. But the, what makes those spaces so creepy and the liminal, a lot of liminal horror is the fact that you can get lost in these spaces. You don't know how to get out of these spaces. And everything looks kind of the same. You know, it's like this a never-ending loop of... You know, if you're in a gigantic office building, it's just this never ending pastel pale kind of wall, you know, a never ending hospital. There's no easy identifiable markers and it's just, yeah, you get lost in this maze. John, did you see there was a movie recently that came out? It was a very liminal space kind of movie where a couple are looking for a home and they go into this weird realty office. The guy seems very strange and he drives them out to this allotment neighborhood where every house looks identical. And they're going back in there and they're following. They're like, this is kind of weird place. And they sh- he shows them the house. He's very odd, very men in black sort of behavior where like he's saying things that aren't normal. Uh, he's acting in very strange ways. And then they're looking at the bedroom or something and then they go out and he's gone. And they're left in this maze of allotments by themselves and they can't, they try to uh, get out and they can't get out. They're there for, the, you know, he starts digging a hole. This is a movie? Yeah, it's a horror film. And then there's a baby dropped off on their doorstep and it turns out that this baby... Not spoiling too much, but this baby is one of these things that this realtor was, and they have to raise it, but it doesn't act like it. It grows very quickly over the course of the film, and it is terrifying, but they have to raise it. Uh, it's it's really bizarre film. Jesse Eisenberg is in it, the guy who played Zuck in the Facebook movie. The movie is called Vivarium. Anyway, I'll give you a link to it, John. Sounds interesting. Sounds different. You would love it. It's It's your kind of movie. I'm surprised there haven't been more horror movies made with liminal spaces, like specifically that genre, just because it seems really popular and I haven't really seen it done a whole lot. 
it seems like kind of ripe for someone to do something extremely creepy in that vein. Well, it's, it's kind of recent. I mean, it started in 2019 with a 4chan thread. Do you see the original photo, John? Oh, uh, no. I'll put it up in the show notes. Allegedly, I think this is the first one. We'll double check, but it's basically just like the shot, kind of the back of an office space with like a part of it opening up into another room. And it leaves you kind of with this feeling of like this empty office space. What's behind that room? Why, why am I seeing a picture of an empty almost like there's something else going on that's not in the picture and you wonder what that is and it kind of draws you in the unsettlingness of it i guess you know it's funny because you you liminal space has been used a lot in movies think about like the matrix that room where he trains yeah jujitsu whatever but you think about liminal horror really the shine exactly things you shouldn't see he's there at a hotel as a winter keeper of the hotel where people are supposed to be no one is ever there so there's these long shots and uh, the atmosphere. I love that. That's my favorite horror, that just long, drawn-out yeah. dread that builds up, and there's no just gory, like, jump scares. It's just right. all a feeling and, and a slow build of terror. Yeah. Well, there's something about the spaces like that, too, that just have this limitless potential for a story to unfold and the unsettling and just the discovery of what is, what might be around that corner. There's that great shot in The Shining where... It's a, I think he's walking up the steps or, or maybe things that you shouldn't in a place or a time that you don't belong. Right. And that reminds me of the back rooms. It's like, it's the back room behind the main office, behind the main building that has an infinite potential of something, basically looking behind the veil of reality at maybe a deeper reality of how things are made constructed in the, on the underside of reality. That's kind of, to me, what the back rooms and like liminal space, I guess, in general is. Yeah. Definitely check out back rooms. If you, I mean, just know it's like a creepy pasta, but it is weird. If you like horror movies, it's a weird, gives you a weird feeling. Yeah. Very surreal. And if you got to wait for the end though, you don't turn it off like Jeremy. <laughs> I should probably finish. I should probably finish it. Because the monsters are, are like, they're freaky. It's hard to explain. You have to just see it, but they, they just, it's like a nightmare. It's like a really bad nightmare. I think the reason why we didn't finish it, Jerry, is because we have that sort of stuff on all the time as ambience that doesn't have an ending. So I was just so used to just seeing like that sort of thing in the background that I just kind of kept moving. I remember there being these guys and yeah, in their hazmat suits. And I remember one scene where they're like jumping down these slides and you didn't know where they're going to come out. Yeah, that was pretty funny. It didn't work out well for some of them, but I think I jumped the other escalator. I don't know if there's a beginning to this where they are people putting on suits. I know it's developed over time, like the, the concept. Yeah, but that's my question is like, they almost feel like... Their whole purpose of the hazmat suit people as beings are to explore these places. And they they were nothing before they were these hazmat suits. I don't know. That's the vibe I got from it. But I, yeah, I haven't looked into it. I'm sure people out there, especially on YouTube, will know. It's very like one dimensional as far as like it doesn't explain a lot. You know, it's just it. it, it is. It just is. It just happened and it is. And there's no explaining behind it. Yeah. It just sort of exists. Look at this weird reality that you're not supposed to see. Exactly. I was looking at something else that I, when I was looking this stuff up, it was called like, it, it creeped me out too. Let's see if I can find that real quick before we go. It's called like weird. I brought some interesting stuff. Qualia. Yeah. Good work. Let's see if I can find that. This is oh weird core. Oh yeah. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. It's like weird lo-fi art. And I didn't think anything of it. I just saw it. But then when I looked at the pictures closer, like they, some of them really make me feel strange. Because they're all eyeballs and stuff, weird <laughs> yeah. eyeball pictures. But if you look at some of them, like they really like at first glance, like that's oh, a weird picture. But then you look at it closer when you blow it up, you're like, oh, that makes me feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it's all thanks to the internet. I know there's so many weird. It's all interesting. All the stuff I've been really getting into. Uh, have you heard of Dungeon Core? No. <laughs> As a music genre, it's it's pretty great. But it's just like this kind of slow paced sort of like you know it can be a plucked instrument or some kind of more droney sort of horn thing but i had it playing in the pool yesterday and i was out there by myself in this little pool in the woods pretty much and i was just floating there and playing this music and it was really uh transcendental what the word is i felt very like my consciousness kind of changing and i was just enjoying being there feeling like i was in charge of this kingdom <laughs> it was like this is my world just floating on my noodle Floating on my noodle. It was wonderful. And then it ended, but it was great. <laughs> Dungeon Core, check it out. Hey, look at the look at the chat that I sent you guys. 
Ooh. Okay, I don't like that. You and your it. It's always it. <laughs> that's not it. It looks very much like it. Yeah, that's got to be it. We'll have to put this in the uh, Aphex twin art. Oh, but it's got the hairdo of the Pennywise, the the recent Pennywise, and the lip. The lip. It does. I guess it does kind of look a little it, but. Well, I see the Aphex twin too. That's not what I. That's not what I meant to. Like window liquor, kind of. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That is very creepy. I'm done with it. Get out of here. We'll have to put this in the show notes and put it on the YouTube for people watching on YouTube. That is straight demonic. Richard James is a demon. John, have you heard of, uh, this is what I'm bringing to the show, apparently. There are so many weird little holes in the internet of this kind of just bizarre genre. So many tunnels. There's probably, you could spend an eternity looking at this stuff. It's just good. It gets weirder and weirder. Yeah. This is one for you, John. This is just another example of just a weird, very small niche of, uh, People that experience something and then kind of form a community around it. Have you ever heard of um, submechanophobia? Oh, yeah, I was going to bring that up. Kind of relates. This is the fear of underwater animatronics. What? You know, rides yeah. with like underwater jaws or a submerged dinosaur. There are people that make video content just about these underwater animatronics. They're not real, though, are they? It's almost like fear porn for people that are, you know, it's animatronics, it's like a mechanical. But it's the uncanny nature of it. No, but does it exist? Are there things that are under the water that are mechanical? Yeah, they're in like a, it's like theme park rides. Well, they were built by, you know, Universal Studios. Right. Oh. But it's the fear of just that, of the animatronic. What rides are underwater that have animatronics? Like the Jurassic Park ride has, they don't have to be completely underwater, but they come out of the water, half submerged. So it's that kind of. There can't be that many of them. What, rides? Yeah. We can watch some videos. There's probably a, a couple dozen at least. Oh, really? And that sparked a whole genre of fears. <laughs> yeah, just Google it, dude. Submechanophobia. Also, it doesn't matter how many there are. It's how many people have experienced them. It does. Think about how many people have experienced them, millions of people, regardless of how many exist out there. It's just this weird fear. Also, you could like any small rinky dink place. Like what's that place in Appalachia? You're thinking of the Atchafalaya Welcome Center. In Louisiana. The Welcome Center has animatronics that are half submerged. Oh, yeah. I think there's some there. But it's just a bizarre thing. Did you guys see Five Nights at Freddy's? No, I, I heard mixed reviews and I didn't think I wanted to spend my time on it. I heard it wasn't great. Yeah. I mean, that game, actually, I, I don't want to play the game. It looks that terrifying. <laughs> yeah, the game, I think. The game looks terrifying. Especially, I guess not if you were watching, like, just regular, but in the in the VR. Yeah. Um, I think it would probably be extremely Terror. I mean, people, I've seen people play it where they can't, they can't play it for very long. It's just so freaky. But yeah, the movie, probably not. But I was hoping it would be good. That's a great example of liminal space, a defunct kid's play place. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's not really a transition, but it's still... Although it is, because it's... Well, it's liminal in the sense that you don't stay there. It's lost its purpose. And it's lost its purpose. Yeah, it just exists without the nature of people. Oh, yeah, that's... Well, oh, okay, I gotcha. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think the problem with the movie from what I heard was that they, well, one of the problems you could argue was that they weren't sure if it should be like a horror comedy or if it should be serious. Yeah, that's never a good place you want to land in a movie like that, I feel. You should have just gone straight horror. I also thought, I saw a preview and then I was like, oh, it's about a guy and his uh, daughter. And then it was actually his younger sister that had disappeared or something, but she looked like she was like 20 years younger. I don't know, I was confused. Anyway. Anyway. It's probably great. Did you guys see the Nick Cage one? <laughs> that one was it's pretty terrible. <laughs> oh, it was that was so bad. <laughs> it was so bad. What is he thinking? He just takes whatever role he can anymore. He knocks a lot out of the park and then some are just... Uh, he does. I feel like he did that one as a favor to someone that he may have known. That's what I... That was my favorite yeah. when I first saw it. Because there, no, there was no famous actors in it or anything. It was all kind of just like low budget. And then you have Nick Cage. Like, does he know somebody? And he didn't like talk at all. <laughs> He's like, okay, but I'm not doing any dialogue. <laughs> I'm just going to show up. Anyway. Uh, Anyways. And now with that, guys, I think we have some very special people to thank. Do it. Hi, guys. Thank you, too. Cheryl Inman Howe, or Hugh. Thank you, Cheryl. Welcome to the hole. You are a friend of us. Samantha Winchester is a dogman whisperer. Kapow. Yay, Samantha. <laughs> Welcome to beer. Rifle time. Uh, Shadow. Is a dogman whisper as well. Ooh, creepy. Skulking in the hole. Steve the Smithy mm. is here. Steve the Smithy? What does that mean? Yes. He is a dogman whisperer. 
Thanks, Steve. That's super sweet. Yes. Welcome to be here, sir. Rochelle Weishers. Weishers? I, that's a new one for me. Or Weishers. I wish you guys could see the names, too, because I am a terrible reader. Uh, thank you to be here. <laughs> Welcome in. John's exposing his right breast. Yes. <laughs> oh, great. I can't see that. Much uh, gratitude for you guys. Thank you. Okay. Kat Stonich is here. Hi, Kat. All right. Meow, Kat. <laughs> How are you doing? Yes! Thank you. Uh, followed by Brandon Gage. Oh, my goodness gracious. I didn't realize this till now. He's a Skywell writer. Skywell? Skywell writer. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Sound the alarm. It's supposed to have a sting. We'll sting it now. Skywell writer. Skywell writer. Brendan Gage, he's a sage of life. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Brendan. We seriously appreciate that extra support, man. That really means a lot. Um, H.M. Calloway, hi. Thank you for supporting the show. Yes. You sound like you should be a captain of a sea vessel. Thank you for joining us. More sea vessels. Fra Frank Sommer is here. Hi, Frank. Hello, Frank. Hello. I didn't even see you come in. We love you. Thank you. Daniel Akins. He is so handsome. What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> it's, so very, it's so very welcoming. I meant to say... Was, <laughs> what are you doing here? Get out. <laughs> I meant I couldn't think of... Like, Thank God you're here. What should I say to welcome you is what I was trying to th was thinking in my head brain. Yes! Welcome, Daniel. Yes, I feel no pain when Akins has arrived. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Laney, hi. You're a dogman whisperer, you are. Yes! <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Right down the Laney of Kevin. Safe Avenue. We are fully out of, <laughs> out of anything at this point. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have nothing left. It was a long night. No, it's just like, we'll keep going. It's good. <laughs> just, just We're having going. a good time. I'm having a great time. There's always a warm-up period. Yeah. Andrew Vollmer, hi, come on in the door. We got your doggy bowl waiting, because you oh. are a doggy whisperer, and we're happy to have you. Yeah, we got your doggy bowl. <laughs> Andrew Vollmer? Andrew Vollmer. 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 I like that. Ooh, cool last name. Yeah, He's man. Gotta be a vampire. Thanks for being in the hole. You sound like a super, superhero bad guy. Superhero bad guy. Superhero bad guy. Otherwise known as a villain. <laughs> Super villain. <laughs> it's Vollmer. Excellent. He's attacking the city. Okay. <laughs> Welcome in. It's terrible. Uh, Justin Bishop. <laughs> Justin Bishop. All right. He is. He's taken my rook because he is a dogman whisperer with his fangs out and his jaws a chomping. He is a chess piece of life. That's right. Chess piece of life. Thank you to be here, my friend. I will cancel. Uh, Megan Houston. Yes. Yes. A city I once lived in. A sprawling metropolis of love. Incredible. She is. Your heart is as warm as the city is in the summer. And you're as tasty as their Indian food district. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it Welcome is good food down there. Uh, Shelby, hi. Welcome to be here, you black-eyed cool kid, you. <gasps> Shelby on the beach with shells. Thank you. Pretty lady. <laughs> Dana Jones. Hi. Welcome to be here. Davy Jones? Dana. Oh. Davy's oh. sister. Davy's sister. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Dana. Awesome. It's a pretty name. Thank you for your support. I hear that very much. Dana, yeah. That's a great name. You're right. Dana Scully. One of my faves. Dana. Uh, Welcome to the hall, Dana. <laughs> Eric Lane. Black Eyed Cool Kid. <gasps> Welcome to be here. Maybe they're related. No, there was a Laney. A Laney before. This is Lane. Thank you to have you. Be a little John. Or B what? B E A is that B B B E A yeah it's B E A yeah B E A I think it's B E A ouch well anyway we love you I think it's B E A B E A little John why don't you be a little John like B E A is she's a dogman whisperer yes in the forest with the fox and Robin Hood and little John there you go slinging the arrows welcome welcome to be here uh, Steph hey yes yes <laughs> Steph <laughs> Steph, hi. Hi, Steph. Hey, Welcome Steph. to have you here. We are Hello. grateful to see you in here. Good to see you in the hole. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. Jason Wetzel, the Pretzel King. Mm. Is that in there or did you make that up? I made that up. Oh, that's good. I like that. Pretzel King. I guess so. He might not <laughs> like pretzels. That's true. Well, he's going to like them right now. Yeah. Jason Wetzel loves a wet pretzel. Let me tell you what. Wet pretzel. And a thick steak of harsh meat. Because he's a dogman whisperer. All right, welcome in. Heart meat? Harsh meat? <laughs> Harsh meat? I don't know what that means. It just came out of my mouth. We love you. He likes meat. He's a dog. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for that support. Yes! Casey Womack is here. Oh, yeah. Womack. Womack. <laughs> Get back, Jack. It's Womack. In the hole. Tame yourself. I feel like Womack would be the competitor to Acme in, like, the cartoons. Like, where are you getting your dynamite from? A Womack? It's Womacks. The, Come on down to Womack. It's the villain's outlet mall. Falmer's running it. <laughs> Was running it. You know who's managing it? Cornelius Branch. Yes, he is. Is managing that evil awesome. Acme store. He is a dogman whisperer. Cornelius. Oh yeah. That's a wonderful name. Yeah. Oh. Cornelius. How do you not respect that name? Yeah. 
Sounds like you're solving the genetics of a future world. Probably not. Welcome in, Cornelius. Uh, Shadow Rodriguez. Yes. Hi. Ooh, nice. Black Eyed Cool Kid. Ooh, nice, nice. Thank you. Working in the shadows. That's two shadows today. John's dancing for you. It's getting a little dark. John, you can't see him, but John is dancing. (laughs) (laughs) Woo! These will be fun when we have video. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Dance! (laughs) Thank you, Shadow Rodriguez. All right, guys, get your rocks ready when you're running down the road because you might have to fight off another Dogman Whisperer, Kyle Martin. All right. The right. Welcome in. Yes. Thank you, Kyle. I like Martin Short. Your last name is his first name. Welcome in, Kyle Martin. Mm. Welcome in, Kyle Martin. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you to see you, Kathy Kramer. Hi. Nice. Nice. Confusing. Why confusing. is that confusing? Wonderful. John is just repeating Wonderful. everything I say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an echo. What is her name? It's K U. Kathy Kramer. Mm. Oh, Kathy Kramer. I thought you had other initials in there. Just Kathy Kramer. Oh, weird. Oh, see you. That's what confused me. Confused me. I said see you to be here. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Good to have oh, you. Oh, gotcha. Alex. Stop it, John! Alex Nielsen. <laughs> <laughs> You're hurting my brain when I laugh and I get spasms. You're hurting my brain when I laugh and I get spasms. Okay, this is enough. I'm okay. going away. <laughs> I'm going away. <laughs> We're really confusing to edit this. Let's be adults. All right, well, let's continue. <laughs> Our- Alex Nielsen is in the hole. Can John, can you welcome him? Yay! Ooh. Or her? Liam is his father. It could be a lady or a fella, Alex. Welcome in, Liam. Thank you so much, Alex. There's no Liam. It's Alex. There's no Liam. <laughs> <laughs> this is crap. Oh, so John said what's Liam Neeson. He's playing yeah. off the last name. Oh, it's, yeah. it's Neeson. Liam Neeson. Yeah, not Nielsen. Come on. Oh, come on. Anyways, Alex, thank you. You are awesome. Zach Wolf is Perfect. here. Yes. Perfect. Does he better be a dog man whisperer? Yes. He, sure. <laughs> is he not? How dare him? He is a black eyed cool kid, which is just as good. <gasps> No, it's not. He knows he'll still get a howl because of his name. Because of his wolf name. Yeah. Yeah, he cheated. Oh, so that's how you sneak him in. That's how you get a sneaky dogman howl when you're not a dog whisperer. Yeah, because we have to do it. What's his first name? Zach Wolf. Zach, here's a treat. Yes. Thank you for joining the brood. You think that's his real last name? If so, I'm jealous. I think it is because it, it ends with an E. That's a great last name. I knew a couple yes. wolves. Cool. Anyway, uh, three shots in podcast. Oh, is back as oh, a nice. dogman whisperer. Rock and roll. Nice. Three shots in podcast. Definitely check out that podcast. Do it. We told you to. Chris Handy is here. Another dogman whisperer. Nice. I need to say a different word. <laughs> Exceptional. Chris Handy. You have the best name in the you world. You are more useful than my Chris. Ouch. Because you are handy. Thank you, Dogman Whisperer. Another Dogman Whisperer, Kaylee Crow. Oh my gosh, it's Kaylee Crow. Nice. We just, we we just, just did conversation with her. We just, yeah, we just did her uh, an incredible story. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> we need that as a draft. What the hell? Uh, thank you so much, Kaylee Crow. Dan, thank you for the wonderful communication and the killer stories you've been sending in. We've got a wolf and a crow. Yay! Nice, right next to each other. We're building a whole animal kingdom. Animal farm. We're building a, no- a belief arc. There you go. That sounds better than a farm. <laughs> farm sounds like we're going to put them to work. <laughs> Welcome in, guys. Thank you. You are on the, on the whole arc. Happy to have you. Uh, Avery Moss is another freaking Dogman Whisperer, guys. Oh, yeah. And now we even got a, a plant. That's oh. right. We've got a moss. A verdant spread of fungi. Is moss a plant? Yeah. It's a fungi, right? No, it's not a fungus. It's, a, it's like an algae. What the hell? It's a land algae. I don't know. Is moss fungus? No, fungus is like mushroom. Oh, you're right. Mosses are non-vascular plants, which means they're lacking a system of vessels inside for the transport of water and nutrients. Thank you. Oh, you're learning even in the in the thank you section. <laughs> you're welcome for that lesson. Thank you, moss. Detritus. Detritus is a great word. <laughs> we need someone to write in with the, the name detritus. Yeah, that's an expansion reference, guys. Get in there. Get in there. Do it. Uh, and last but definitely not least for the evening... April Peterson. Excellent. Ooh. April Peterson is here. Don't get me into the show. So I want to tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, April. Yes. You are awesome. You also have the name of uh, our original grandparents before they changed their names. That's true. So extra special high fives to you. All right, guys, thank you so much for your support. You are all awesome and amazing for being here. Yeah, you guys are wonderful. Keep us growing and glowing and showing and rowing. Growing. Keep the whole glowing. Big, big hugs. Couldn't do it without you. Anyways, we've definitely covered a lot today. That is true. We have covered a lot. Hope you guys dug it. Definitely join us in the expansion. We're going to get into some even stranger stories. Beachside. Oh, yeah. They probably won't all be beaches, but that's uh, going to be definitely a focus. This seems to be timely for right now, for us anyway, so this should be fun. Oh, I was going to say, we didn't talk about this because I forgot to mention it, but 
that podcast that I referenced earlier, uh, what are they called, Jer? Hometown Haints. Hometown Haints. I forgot. On that blog about the shadow people, they do have a at the very bottom a YouTube video of bathrooms, why bathrooms are liminal spaces and why they're so haunted. And I just happened to play a, a couple seconds of it. And when the bathroom they mentioned in there is in St. Augustine, where we're going to be staying at a seafood restaurant and pub. Oh, that's such a cool little town. Yeah, I've never been. Jeremy's been there. But anyway, we're going to go through there and we're going to go have dinner at that place. And then I'm going to use that bathroom. <laughs> it's a women's restroom, Chris. Oh, well, it's 2024. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want. You'll pass. <laughs> anyway on that note join us in the expansion and uh until then we will see you next time on, on belief hole all right we'll see you later bye-bye bye Tails. get over here yeah thank you scorpion john <laughs> all right guys we'll see you next time on, on belief hole <laughs> get it <laughs>